Good morning, everyone. This is normally the time of the business council meetings that we, are, that we use for networking, although that's a bit harder in this format. So go ahead and grab your coffee and get settled in. We'll begin in two minutes. Awesome. I texted John to see if he's coming. Okay. Thank you. Is Jamie, is Jamie going to be part of it? Uh, she had a conflict. Okay. Drinking my morning celery juice. Can you, <laughs> can you can you resend the Zoom link to John? He's having a tough time finding it. And is that his J Marty at Senate.mn? His official uh, his official thing. Yeah. Okay. I'm sending it to both just in case. Awesome. Thank you. Good morning. If you're just joining us, this is normally the time that we use for uh, at the business council that we use for networking. Well, it's a, bit, it's a bit harder in this format. Go ahead and grab your coffee and get settled in. We're waiting for one more panelist and we'll begin the program. Looks like Senator Hooray. Marty got in. Hooray! My apologies. I I had the website link instead of the Zoom link. No worries. Okay, I think we're gonna get started. Take it away, Shannon. Fantastic. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Roseville Business Council. My name is Shannon Watson. I'm the Director of Public Affairs with the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this is our fourth meeting of the year and the second one we've done virtually. So thank you all for hanging in there with us. Um, while we can't be together in person, we're making this technology work to deliver the content that's valuable to the business community and doing what we can to provide ways for you to still make those connections that count, um, including one of my favorites, interacting on Twitter. Um, please use the hashtag Roseville Business Council, all spelled out, um, to tweet along if you have questions or observations. Um, John, I know it, it's still not the same and you're, I bet you're missing out on the handshakes. Absolutely, Shannon. Yeah, this is a this is a time when I love to do the meet and greet, and it's just as a a time that uh, I miss actually. But hey, we can meet virtually, and this is great stuff. John Connolly, president of the Twin Cities North Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us, and this is a wonderful Wednesday morning. Uh, we got the rain out of the way. Now it's going to be beautiful this week. I am missing those discussions that usually happen, and I know that you're all wondering who's with us uh, this morning at this meeting. So I'd like to go through. Uh, a small list of registrants so that we can uh, do a shout out to those folks. So, Shannon, uh, can you have that list for me? All right, I've got a list on the foul, and I've got Ann, Carolyn, Ed Stadinsky, Faye Simmer, Janice Gunlock, Jason Eppen. Jeannie Kelsey, uh, I've got a Jeremy and a uh, Lisa Laliberte, Lisa McCormick, uh, M. Rausch, Mary Jo McGuire, Matthew Schrappeller, and Melissa Barnes. Those are the folks I've got so far on my list. So uh, now I'd like to introduce Julie Wern from the Roseville Visitor Association to kick off our meeting today. Julie. Thank you, John. Again, my name is Julie Warren and I'm um, with the Roseville Visitors Association and we're responsible for selling the hospitality industry on a local, regional and national basis. And right now our hospitality industry has been devastated by COVID. Um, what we are hoping to do is we're working on Roseville in Bloom, which is Roseville's first public art project. And it's all outside, social distancing acceptable and we're just hoping that that's going to bring residents out into our parks. It's going to bring some visitors in who are going to look at the statues, 
hopefully, you know, visit one of our restaurants, either dine outside or take out, shop in one of our stores and perhaps stay overnight in one of our hotels. And Roseville and Bloom will run from July 1st through October 30th. So again, it's a great outdoor event, hands-free, social distancing, acceptable, built right into it. So we hope everybody gets out and, and takes a look at it come July 1st. And with that, I'd like to welcome Mark Hodenek from Highway Federal Credit Union to introduce our speakers this morning. Mark? Well, thank you, Julie. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Hodenek with Highway Federal Credit Union. My apologies that you can't see me today, but uh, I hope that everyone is staying safe and well. Please help me welcome our panelists. Our speakers today are Representative Alice Hausman, Senator Jason Isaacson, and Senator John Marty. Our mayor, Dan Rowe, will be serving as the moderator. Please give them all a warm welcome round of applause as we get them visible on the screen. Well, good morning. I'm Dan Rowe. Uh, as uh, was stated, I'm going to be uh, the moderator of this uh, event. And I should uh, point out uh, behind me is uh, one of the roses from the Roseville and Bloom uh, uh, project. Uh, just wanted to use that as a backdrop because it's a little more interesting than my office. Uh, I want to thank all of the uh, representatives and senators uh, who are participating. And I should mention also that uh, Representative Jamie Becker Finn had a conflict this morning. Uh, otherwise, she would have been participating as well. Um, so first, we should probably start with a round of introductions, uh, and uh, why don't we uh, begin with Representative Hausman, and then Senator Isaacson, and then Senator Marty. Uh, what would you like from us? Uh, just a, maybe a quick 20-second bio and, and uh, introduction as to who you are and sort of what you've been doing in the legislature. Um, so uh, the, the last couple of years, I've been chairing the uh, Housing Finance and Policy and housing has become a critical issue. And it's uh, made even worse by uh, this uh, COVID, COVID um, uh, pandemic because um, all of the people who've lost their jobs in hotels, in, in uh, bars and restaurants, in uh, retail, uh, they're the very people who we know something about their hourly uh, pay and they're likely a one paycheck away from not being able to pay their rent or mortgage. And so we've put a lot of effort into that. Um, this has been a very strange uh, session in that we barely started and we had to go remote and we've actually been um, attending sessions from our living room, which has been very strange, um, voting remotely. Um, and we have a lot of unfinished business. Um, it, it's much harder when you're not sitting around a table to get work done. And, uh, and so uh, there's just so much unfinished work and uh, People are still working and negotiating uh, the bonding bill, uh, how, our response to housing and other, uh, other issues. So we'll talk more about that. Right, thank you, Senator Isaacson. Oop, you have to unmute. So embarrassed, I usually am pretty good at that. Uh, thank you, uh, Jason Isaacson, uh, as you know, Senator for part of Roseville and then some more Northern suburbs, Shoreview, Badness Heights, Arden Hills, Mounds View, Gem Lake. Uh, and I uh, have been lucky enough, despite being in the minority, to serve on four committees. Uh, I'm on higher education as an advocate and really pushing for a stronger higher education system, uh, working on jobs and economic development, on uh, uh, health care reform, which was a newer committee for me, and one in which uh, I had to spend most of my time Googling terms just to keep up with what everybody was saying. Uh, that's more of John Marty's bailiwick there. So I was just learning. And then... For reasons I'm not sure I get, I'm on ag and uh, rural development and housing. Uh, and so uh, they told me I look like a farm boy, and I think we ran on Democrats in rural Minnesota. So I got selected to be on the ag committee, to be honest. And uh, I made the mistake of telling them my, my family farm was from Barrett, and that's how that happened. And so uh, I spent most of my time uh, this session, Alice is exactly right, uh, kind of adjusting to the awkward new reality of being online and then advocating in the COVID crisis uh, for a lot of types of relief, whether it's uh, protection from eviction to uh, most recently a co-author on the bill uh, that's looking at really uh, bringing back some uh, support for small small businesses, micro businesses, your kind of main street businesses and your boutique businesses trying to support our local uh, business owners. And uh, we're working still on getting that through 
uh, uh, hopefully in a special session in agreement with the governor, and it has some real wide ranging positive effects. And that's been kind of the, what I've spent the last couple of weeks just trying to usher or heard through uh, some agreements with the governor. And so uh, that's what I'll be also working on if we're able to get a special session. All right, thank you, uh, Senator Isaacs and Senator Marty. All right, thank you, Mayor. It's, it's good to be here with everyone. And yes, as the other two have mentioned, it's been quite a change as every part of our lives has been changed. And I think uh, virtually 100% of the population has been affected negatively. Um, it's a new reality we're learning to live with. And, and as Alice mentioned at the beginning, it's um, changed the way we do work at the Capitol as every business has found out. I think that the COVID crisis is not only the thing that shaped our session, but it shapes the way we, what we have to do right now in terms of preparing for one, a crisis that I think most of us sort of feel, well, we've been doing this for a couple of months and now we're beginning to loosen up. So it's most of the way over when reality is cases are doubling every 16 days now, which is less, less bad than having them double every seven days but um, the cases are still going up, the death toll continues to climb. And I think we're all, how do we move on in the life we have to live in a world where it's dangerous? And I think that the one thing that I've noticed from this, I serve on uh, three committees, the Health and Human Services Finance Committee, and I serve on the Finance Committee itself, which deals with the overall budget issues. And, um, and it's a, Big challenge now because our budget went from a $1.6 billion surplus to about $4 billion south of that in less than two months' time, and we don't know what the future is going to hold. And so I, I think we have to keep working on how we're going to address this with the idea that the COVID crisis did not make our problems, did not cause a lot of our problems. It just made them worse and exposed what was there. Alice mentioned housing, Jason mentioned business stuff. Um, healthcare is the same thing. We find out that our society in many ways was just skating on the surface. People are, as one of them mentioned, a paycheck away from um, financial crisis and housing crisis and healthcare. We have a system now where every state is, every hospital is fighting with each other to get basic equipment and nobody's doing any organized planning and thinking ahead of this. We're just trying to keep our heads above water now. And I think it suggests that after the crisis, not only do we have to work to rebuild the economy as quickly as we can, but we also have to make sure we are better prepared for future crises, whether it's from a pandemic or whatever the cause, because we can't have it where we're just barely making it and then things turn south and we have people running around in chaos. So. I think that we all recognize things are not the same, they're not going to be the same, and how do we best do it so we can live together in a productive society um, despite things that hit us that are going to happen from time to time. Thank you, uh, Senator Marty, uh, and thank all of you again for being here this morning. Uh, it seems like sometimes the life of a legislator is going from preparing for the session uh, to being in the session to then explaining and answering questions about the session. And so this is that, that third phase that I'm sure you'll have many opportunities, including this one in the coming uh, days and weeks uh, for. Uh, but once again, we do appreciate that. I should let folks know who are attendees, if you wish to uh, ask a question of the panelists, uh, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, feel free to click on that and uh, type in your question. Uh, we'll take a look at that uh, periodically, but we do have a, a set of uh, you know, prepared questions uh, in case you're kind of shy uh, to begin with here. Uh, so we'll get into the, the prepared questions. Uh, and the first one, uh, you know, we, we talked, especially this year, I think a lot about things that didn't get done in the session. It, it probably is worth mentioning some of the things that did get done uh, because there was definitely business done by the legislature. And I think there was, uh, especially early after the onset of, of COVID, there was some some fairly good bipartisanship going on as well in, in, in some of those efforts. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of highlight some of the things that were uh, uh, accomplished and signed off by the governor. And, uh, and we can all uh, look back on, uh, you know, and be glad that they're taken care of uh, in this session. So maybe we'll start with Senator Marty. In, in terms of, I'm sorry, the, in terms of things we did get done. Right, 
Um, and and it, it seems to me now, just looking back at the session, that most of the things were COVID requirement. I mean, we spent, we passed, most of the bills we passed were allowing somebody to have an exemption to something, simple things like driver's licenses, uh, which have been, people have them come up and you got a month to get them fixed. And a lot of people who were ready for taking care of that had all the offices shut down in the meantime. And now we got that their backlog in a crisis. So trying to extend things, the governor could do a lot of them by executive order, but I think the governor and the legislature felt it was best in most cases not to push the authority and say, well, the governor can do it just by executive order, but, but to try and do it in an orderly manner. And then so trying to extend deadlines for issues, trying to work it out so that we could accomplish things, how we deal with the schools remotely and so on. So in terms of sheer volume, I'm gonna just say that the COVID crisis was the number of issues. Um, lots of, when I keep thinking of the issues we passed um, in terms of environmental issues, we, we did the funding for some of the things outdoor heritage, but we didn't do a lot of new areas because there wasn't agreement on them. And by the time we got to the COVID crisis, it was kind of, if there's agreement about all four caucuses, then we can move ahead. And um, there were some things were caused by lack of progress in one of the minority caucuses, the Senate were the DFL in the minority or the House Republicans, but um, everything from the bonding bill and so on, it was largely either COVID related or didn't get done, but I'll let Jason or Alice talk about other things that we did get done because it was small in terms of other numbers. It was far fewer than other years. Uh, one of those, for example, was the insulin issue, which which uh, carried over from last year already. And we did finally get some resolution between the House and the Senate and passed a bill. Um, there's also been some discussion at the federal level about that. Um, everyone understands um, the insulin crisis uh, after we had a high profile uh, death of an individual uh, and whose mother uh, put a huge amount of energy into keeping that issue before us. We also did the broader um, prescription transparency, not just insulin, but looking at some of the other uh, issues. So, uh, but as John said, so much of it was initial uh, need to respond to COVID and tweak things that, that weren't working, uh, weren't meeting deadlines and so forth. Uh, and it was easy to get to uh, agreement on all of those. So our first, I think our first four bills passed very quickly with uh, bipartisan support. And then we ground to a halt. And, um, and I can just speak to the, the housing pieces um, because they were always linked to something else. So for example, I, I talked about um, the people who couldn't pay their rent. So we had a bill that would have said, we're going to put 100 million into housing assistance um, because we wanted to keep everyone stable, including landlords. So that money would have gone directly to landlords uh, to pay the rents for all the people who had lost their jobs. But we couldn't accomplish it because um, the Senate majority said, before we do that, we want to take away some of the governor's powers. We're not happy with um, the amount of, um, of uh, power that he's exerting in this particular instance. So they linked the governor's power with doing housing assistance. And, and when you do that, inevitably, um, you, you run, run up against a, 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 grid, a partisan gridlock. And Senator Isaacson. Hey, I'd like to try to be more positive, but I, I really can't. Uh, we had some really good stuff initially. Everybody was on board. We were all rowing the boat. And then um, once the shock of it kind of started the way it did and we kind of got into our usual situations, we just saw, you know, I mean, we saw some things just kind of grind to a halt and there were, you know, disagreements on both sides. And, you know, and, I, and I'd like to blame it all on, on the Republicans, but I can't. I know that we that, that there were some games played on both sides in terms of adding things to bills that killed it, that did not, um, weren't germane to the COVID situation uh, and bills that I would agree with in a normal situation, but I wanted to stay focused on COVID. And so I think that that was fairly disappointing aspect of session uh, uh, that it was hard to avoid kind of the inertia of what usually happens and it's unfortunate. and. That's what happens when you have 201 people with election certificates who all have ideas of how things should be done. And it's really uh, frustrating that way. 
uh, I know that there were some things in higher ed we were really trying to get done that would have been more helpful for students and looking at how to help our universities. Uh, and like one area that I think we just missed a real golden opportunity was bonding. There was some real opportunity to help out with HEPR, which is higher ed education asset preservation. Uh, and we just, the, the universities were in, in Men's State were just virtually ignored in my opinion from what they should have been able to receive. And that's part of the reason why on the Senate side, the bonding bill didn't go through outside. Uh, you can thank Kurt Doubt for politicizing uh, the bonding bill of uh, 100% and that's where that kind of fell apart as well. So uh, I would say that the initial response to COVID was very promising and then it kind of devolved from there. So uh, just to kind of follow up on that, do you think that, um, that there was probably more chance for success in this session, um, maybe given how everybody was coming into it this year, than the COVID situation sort of allowed to happen because there wasn't, as you were saying, that ability to talk to people, sort of pull people aside in the hallways or have that, that normal legislative process where it maybe made brinksmanship more, more uh, effective? I would actually say that no, <laughs> that the, the bipartisan came when the COVID happened and people really realized we had to come together and fix some stuff. And that kind of broke through some of the stuff initially. I think that was probably the trajectory uh, the, what I'm talking about in terms of the negativity was probably the trajectory to begin with, partly because that's the nature of the last session before an election, and then partly because I think there's a divide going on. But I think initially with the COVID stuff, at least my experience, and I can't speak for the House at all, Alice would be better at that. Um, my experience was that there was some real people that really wanted to get some good stuff done, and then it devolved back again, is how I described it. I don't know, John, would you say that's fair to say in the Senate? Yeah, I, I think it is true. I mean, there was right when the COVID crisis hit, we're all kind of the circle together and, hey, we all got to help each other. And I think that was very important. Uh, the one thing where, Dan, what you mentioned does happen, and that is like at the beginning of this call, how people said, you know, we're missing the socializing, the chance to talk and share ideas. And I think a lot of that happened right after the COVID thing. We all want to work together, but well, okay, I'll call somebody up and we'll try and reach them. You can't talk to a group of two or three um, hey, I may have used Zoom a couple of times in my life before this last couple of months. And, um, and I, I do think there's some silver linings to this because I think we have to find the silver linings. It's something we have to live with. And I think we can do a lot of things more efficiently through meeting remotely like this and so on. But on the other hand, you need the social ties. And this being in an election year, that unfortunately always hurts too. And it, it scares me to see the hyper-partisan divide we've got now. I, I talked to one candidate who was considering running for office in greater Minnesota, and she says she's scared to run because of the hatred of, if she lists her party, neighbors and others who don't know, a lot of them will hate that. And um, that's kind of scary when we're getting that kind of a divide. And I think a lot of that is part of the whole color of what's happened to the nation in the last couple of years. And I think a lot of it comes from the federal government, from the president, frankly. Um, I think the divisive attitude, we're supposed to see Democrats and Republicans as colleagues and opponents politically even, but not enemies. And we're turning people into enemies. And I think that that's a scary time. But um, some of that comes back when we have a chance to meet face to face. But I, I I very much worry. None of us mentioned the horrific crisis with George Floyd yesterday, but um, but I think that that kind of division in our society is it's it's deadly, and I think we have to find a way around that. And even without the COVID crisis, we were not on very good terms right now, and I think we have to find a way to bring that back. But to your point, Mayor, um, uh, I miss terribly the opportunity to sit around a table. Um, and, and have conversation. And it's all the visual cues. You know when someone is going to start talking. <laughs> you have, you have uh, paper in front of you. I didn't realize how, uh, even in, a, in, in the day of computers, I still really like to have paper in front of me. So you can consult the bill. You consult the, the bill brief very quickly. Um, and so all of those visual cues, I think we miss. Um, separate from this uh, crisis, from the start of the session, I had, uh, I literally was begging because I knew what was at stake in bonding. It is so important for us to get that capital investment bill. It, that does all public infrastructure. 
we failed to do uh, anything major last year. And as Jason said, uh, higher education and so many others are, are waiting for asset preservation dollars. Um, and that's only possible if we pass the bonding bill. And so I had begged uh, from day one, let's sit down right now, House and Senate, Republicans and Democrats and the governor's office and start working together on a bonding bill. Uh, the, the divide is, is so great. And once I saw them, once I saw the governor's bill and the House and the Senate, they are so vastly different from one another um, that uh, it's going to take a huge amount of negotiation to work out those differences. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that happened in these bonding bills that we have never done before are the amount of earmarks for transportation projects, massive, massive uh, number of, of earmarks. Uh, in, in years past, that simply wouldn't have been done because that politicizes um, uh, road building and, and bridge building. And so um, there's, there's a lot to work out um, and we're, we're removed from one another. One of the things I hear Senator Senjum say, he's the uh, chair, Senate chair of capital investment, that he hasn't been able to work with uh, Representative Murphy, who is the house chair, because she's up in Hermantown and technology hasn't worked very well for them to be talking to one another. So uh, to your point, Mayor, I think um, the, the nature of, of this lack of communication is affecting our work product. Thank you, Representative Houseman. Uh, and that, I think, kind of segues into a uh, follow-up on the special session that uh, seems fairly likely to happen in, in June. I think, uh, you know, if nothing else, based on the, the timing of, of the governor's orders and things like that, uh, and uh, bonding is one of those things that's talked about as, as, a, as a topic to be taken up uh, in the special session. What, uh, what do you see as the prospects for you know, the session itself and, and what might be taken up and, uh, and what might not be? Well, I, I heard a little bit of good news. I heard Dean Erdahl, he's our um, uh, Republican lead on, on the uh, Capital Investment Committee in the House. Uh, I heard him say somewhere in the last couple of days that he was going up to St. Paul to start working on bonding. So I cheered that. I thought there's, there, there's a good sign. Uh, it means people are starting to get together. And um, um, I had thought that that special session was a definite, uh, but um, Senator Marty, Senator Isaacson, maybe you have heard more of the conversation. My understanding was there was a little pushback now from uh, Senator Gazelka. Uh, uh, about a readiness for that uh, June 12th date. Um, and so it, it seems less sure now. I don't know if, if either of you yeah. have. They, um, Rosen, Senator Rosen recently said in a, a Zoom call that there was very little chance of a special session on June 12th. I see. Um, uh, there are um, some definite misgivings with the governor over the way he interpreted the vote for the contracts for public employees. And he, uh, and as you may know, the Republicans passed the contracts with an addendum, and uh, it is believed by the governor's office that the that the, that this legislature doesn't have the right to negotiate the contracts, and so it took it as just passing the contracts, and so that will create some, I'm sure, some legal issues down the road. Uh, that and and uh, and their view of the governor's handling of emergency powers, uh, despite his uh, enormously positive approval ratings of his handling, they believe that's a problem, and so they're kind of taking their ball and going home with that until there's more discussions. Um, and so uh, I've been told that, you know, that could change in a dime, right? But that's what that's what I've heard at this point. John, have you heard anything different? Yeah, no. And and I frankly think, well, the, first of all, the date has to happen if the governor wants to extend the emergency orders, which I think he has to do. So I think we will be there when you say they're not going to have it. We're not going to have a special session. Yeah. If the legislature, Paul Gazelka, can make sure we adjourn that day if he wants. Yeah. Um, but but at least we have to be called in. And I actually think this idea of knowing in advance, because we all knew there was going to be a special session a month out, I think that actually is something we should be thinking about planning in future years, because the last weekend of the session, despite the very big slowdown of what has to happen, just it takes takes 20 minutes for a vote in the Senate and I think half hour for a roll call vote in the House, something that normally can take less than a minute. Um, <laughs> when you see that kind of slowdown in the process, you would have a, had an extremely hectic last weekend of the session. We've got to do this or nothing can change until January. Well, we know we're going to be back in a month. 
So, well, let's plan ahead and use it. I think that could take stress off future end of sessions if we just sort of agree in advance, we'll have a one or two day special session mm -hmm. a month later. But if we're, but as far as what happens, I mean, I think Alice's point about the bonding bill that, um, that the House minority is planning to work ahead on it, that would help. It, it's just, I think Alice mentioned a little while ago how she was saying all along, we got to get going on the bonding bill because you need a super majority. You got to put it together. It's a very artful, time consuming process. When the Senate, uh, our party's lead on the bonding committee, was trying, was calling Senator Senjum, trying to get meetings week after week after week and not getting it. And um, it was kind of, well, we do this at the end. You can't do something that big and that complex very quickly. And so I think we have to be planning ahead because that special session, it will likely only be a day or two. And then one would be required a month later if the emergency continues. And so I think we can count on several of these coming, but uh, that doesn't guarantee anything's gonna happen. I hope it does because that would be a really positive way to move us forward. And actually for the state's economy, I think it's essential because the bonding bill is about the only way we can stimulate the economy at the state level. I want to just say real quick, uh, you're right. When I say not going to happen, I didn't mean we're going to meet. I meant we're going to do anything. <laughs> Sorry, I should have clarified that. And the second thing I want to point out that I think John said that bears repeating is that uh, there was efforts by our Lee to meet with Stenjum literally every week that we were there and she could not get him to return calls, would not engage. And instead what he did is he engaged with seven Democrats he thought he could pick off, speaking to Alice's earlier point on earmarks. And that was a, kind of the traditional old school approach, it seems like from what I've seen by some of these people, rather than having a real open, uh, transparent process, which is what you see Alice has done in the past. And that was really frustrating uh, because uh, never once, and I mean, this isn't hyperbole, did Paul Gazelka reach out to Susan Kent about passing a bonding bill. Uh, and that uh, really just demonstrates just how insular that process was for them. And then you saw that in the result of how poor their bill was and the fact that it went down and we didn't vote for it. You know, one, one of the things I think that's keeping us from feeding an urgency about um, accomplishing an agenda right now is there is an assumption, not only will we be back on June 12th, but we will be back a number of times in this interim because unlike the federal government, the state has to have a balanced budget. And in this time of uncertainty, uh, as uh, Senator Marty said, uh, we had projected a, a surplus, but now in fact, there, there may be a, a deficit that we have to deal with. Now, the good news for Minnesota is um, we have been preparing for this day for a number of years. We have been gradually putting money into a savings account, into a cash reserve account, and into cash flow. They are fully funded in the cash reserve. It's well over $2 billion that we have in the savings account and another 350 million in a cash flow account. So we are better prepared, I think, than many states um, because we have put that cushion aside. Uh, but it still means we have to make very careful uh, decisions. Um, and, and so there's an assumption that, that we might be back a couple of times to adjust the budget uh, so that it stays in balance. And, and so I think we're already anticipating a rocky interim. And I'd like to add one, one thing to this about the state's capacity to deal with this. Um, Alice mentioned we were well prepared in terms of it better than a lot of other states. But because we have a balanced budget requirement and because we are now facing, a, we don't know how big, but likely face a huge deficit, there's not much the state can do other than a bonding bill in which we stimulate the economy. But the federal government is going to have to step in. They stepped in in a big way in terms of trillions of dollars, but um, which I think is essential for a lot of the workers who've been laid off, a lot of the businesses who are threading or on the thin edge of shutting down permanently. Um, I think that we're gonna need more of that because you look at the local governments, everything local governments have been doing, they're having huge increase in costs, Hennepin and Ramsey County particularly but a lot of local governments have had huge increase in costs for public safety, for personal protective equipment, for everything else. At the same time, their revenues are falling way off. Businesses are closed, they're not paying sales tax. 
their employees are not paying income tax or not whatever. So government revenues at the state and local level are gonna fall way off. And so we're gonna to have to do something. I think mayor and city council, I hope are not in as deep a trouble as, as other, like some of the counties will be and so on. But nevertheless, it's gonna be hard on everyone. And, and the state to say, well, if the state's gotta cut back, well, what's it do? It cuts back to global government aid, it cuts back on this. So we've got, uh, there's no real easy way out of it for any state or local government. We're gonna need federal help. And I'm encouraged by the fact that so far, Congress has, although on a rough way, they and the White House have gotten at least money out to people, large amounts of money out. But um, I think when you look ahead, we're gonna need a lot more, or we're gonna have a lot of state and local governments that are gonna be declaring bankruptcy or in that shape. And, and then, I'm sorry, Dan. <laughs> I can do oh, that's right. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things that I hear in the drumbeat, uh, you know, from my friends across the aisle, that I think there's a real kernel of truth to that I, I'm, I'm also very concerned about is that, you know, I take the, the health of humans, obviously, as my first priority. And I believe that this is a real dire situation we find ourselves in, and that it's only going to get worse. Uh, and so I'm thinking about first the health right now. But then my second question is, is that what do we do to ensure that if we can't be open like we'd like to be, we can protect and support businesses so when we come back, those businesses are still there. And that's really been my, you know, now that I feel like we're getting some, at least the beginnings of a grasp of how we can distance and do the things right, hopefully not, in my opinion, be too uh, cavalier with, with how we open up when you see some of the other states and what they've done, and then you see their spikes, uh, that's bad. Uh, and so, one of the things I was speaking about earlier was just really finding a way to protect our medium and small businesses in Minnesota. I have a, a Pilates studio I'm working with right now to try to get them uh, up and running again, working with Deed. And I, and I encourage all the people online that are here today that are business owners to reach out because I am constantly daily bugging the governor's office in Deed for more information on ways we can find uh, 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 ways to open up or provide supports for those businesses we just can't open up because it doesn't work, right? And I wanna be really clear about something. Uh, one of the things that I hear a lot about was people that are frustrated with the governor's one size fit all approach to uh, closing businesses down. And I wanna, you know, he gets that from the president and the CDC and Homeland Security. This isn't like he came up with a plan and said, this is what we're gonna do and, and that's how it's gonna work. This is the plan that had been set down and given to us by the federal government how we should approach this. And now it's our job to nuance that so it matches what our state needs more. And that's kind of the tension you feel right now is going through that process of matching what our state needs. And I think it's gotta be dual process, dual track. One track has gotta be, where does it make sense? Can a Pilates studio open up outside and do outside stuff if they do social distancing? I don't see a problem with that. Can uh, stores that do one-on-one -on -one approach to boutique help, uh, whether it's wedding services or it's it's uh, personal fitness and they have a plan for how they're going to handle that i also don't have a problem with that right but when situations where you have a ton of people working out unsupervised where we don't know if stuff's being clean i don't think that's a good idea so on one side we find the businesses we can open put them back on the other side what are we doing to support those businesses so we at least keep the lights on and them functioning in a way that doesn't bury them in debt when this is over that's the other side of it and that's another bill that Senator Anderson and I have been working on uh, with uh, Tim Mahoney and Zach Stevenson, trying to find a way to get those things across the finish line to help them. And that's really crucially important in the long term for our health because it would suck to come out of this where we were able to save a ton of lives, which is good, but we also put our econ economy in ruins. If there's a way to do both, that's my goal. And I think that's something we have to be more focused on. And it's been tough because frankly, it's been pitted into this partisan divide where either you believe COVID's bad and you want to protect people or you don't believe COVID's bad and you're trying to protect business as if there's as if they're not mutually exclusive, right? As if those two things are existing separately. The reality is, is we want to keep people healthy and we want to protect business the best we can. And finding that middle ground has been difficult. And that's where I've seen the biggest divide in terms of how people are framing this discussion. And I just reject that narrative. We need to be doing both. Well, and, and just to, to follow up on that, I think that's something that certainly this audience is interested in is, yeah. is you know, helping the businesses survive. Uh, and is that, you know, with all the talk of 
sort of the partisanship and uh, it's an election year and everything else that's going on nationally or, or the environment. I mean, is that an area where, uh, you know, people in both parties can find some common ground to provide assist? It may not be everything that one party wants and it may not be everything the other party wants, but do you think that that is something that as we're going forward, we can, we can see some more broad agreement on and maybe some actual uh, action that can well, be brought to the governor for signature? There is broad agreement on it, I think, until you get into our leaderships and then it gets to be kind of messy. And I'm not saying any one leadership's bad or wrong, but that's where it gets tough because there's competing agendas happening, right? And I think we got to cut through the clutter and say these two focuses are more important than our next election. They're more important than the partisan politics. And they're certainly more important than what's happening at the federal level. They're just so important because they're part of our basic fabric. And if we don't do that, we're going to have problems. I'm not 100% confident in that, but that is the agenda I'm pushing 100%. And I think there was broad agreement that, uh, that both the federal government and the state government um, were, were wanting to, to help with small business grants. So we, we have a, a bill in the House that passed on the House floor, specifically called the Economic Security Act, and that included some uh, small business uh, uh, grants. That, um, we have, that's one of those that we haven't quite resolved with the Senate yet. The dilemma is, so everyone is that's agreeing. That's my bill. Let, Let's get, let's get this uh, money out the door as fast as we can and get it to where the real need is. So that's agreement. It's the process of doing that, that where we stumble. So you saw the federal government had a plan and then very quickly it became uh, controversial because they discovered some of the money had gone to the biggest players. What was it, Sna Snack Shack or what? <laughs> I can't remember the, the fast food. And so, uh, and some of that, became embarrassing to those bigger companies and they actually gave the money back. But how do you get the money to the small business? It's a structural um, process that we don't necessarily have in place to accomplish that quickly. Well, I can, tell, I can just tell you uh, from the local perspective, we do hear quite often when things don't seem to be working at the state level or certainly at the federal level, uh, you know, what can, what can the city of Roseville do? or what can the city of Shoreview do, you know? And, uh, and we really are quite limited. We don't have nearly yes. the resources of the state or the federal government. And uh, we're trying to do things. I know Shoreview has a $5,000 grant program. We're looking at what we can do in Roseville. And, and I know the counties uh, will be talking later about their uh, program using some of the federal money that they've, they've received to be able to, uh, to you know, help out with. But certainly my message back to the legislature would be is, uh, you know, uh, help. Uh, yes. You know, do, fill, do fulfill your role where you can, uh, and and uh, and try to find that way past some of those obstacles if you can. And frankly, that was one of the things that we didn't finish. Uh, uh, Representative Marquardt is the person in the House who is uh, uh, charged with the responsibility of getting that federal money out to Minnesota as fast as possible. Um, who's the senator? Who, uh, uh, Jason and or John? Who's who's uh, Marquardt's? Counterpart is it? Um, is oh, it's Rude? Chamberlain. Well, it's Chamberlain is the counterpart, but Rude is Rude, Senator Rosen is the one that makes the final Ro decision. Rosen, yes, I think it was yeah. Rosen. It's, I think it's Rosen and Marquardt, and mm -hmm. they didn't didn't decide between them. And again, that this is where um, there's a bit of an ideological um, bent. I think uh, Senator Rosen wanted more of the money to go to Greater Minnesota. Um, Paul Marquardt, because he also strongly um, has a large contingent of his caucus who are from Hennepin County and Ramsey County, um, believed that where the need is greatest is where the money should go. And so that standoff hasn't been resolved, how, how Minnesota uh, spends the federal money. And that money should have been out the door by now already. And, and Mayor, to your question about what can the cities do, I mean, I guess what I'd say is, keep trying to do the best job you can, which I think we have to do too, because it's not just, it's not just the crisis, it's everything else in the meantime. Uh, the city of Roseville had asked for legislative help in, in being able to regulate hotels because of some problem ones with human trafficking in Roseville. And a huge issue, and I don't know of any opposition to it from either party, but nevertheless, that kind of thing gets tied up in the, well, it's something that should have been done in a normal session, but it wasn't a normal session and didn't get done. And then there are increased problems from things like um, elections. 
I mean, what happened in Wisconsin for their primary where people were going out and risking their health and their lives for going over to vote, I, I think that uh, Secretary of State here has been pushing for mail balloting so people could vote from home, not through the complex um, absentee ballot process where you have to have a witness sign your thing, um, but through a simple vote by mail, which a lot of rural communities were given that authority by the legislature in the past. I think we should give it to everyone. But um, those kind of issues have to be done on top of it. So basically, we all have to do our own job plus extra stuff. And so, I, I mean, I wish I had great advice for the city. Uh, I don't. I, I think you and we have to try to do the best we can in the situation we're in. But we have more challenges because of the crisis, but plus getting the ordinary things done. I had a bill, a simple little bill, trying to stop crack down on catalytic converter things catalytic converters underneath your car, you might be able to put a new one in. Uh, you might be able to buy one for not too much, but the scrap metal in it can be worth a couple hundred dollars. So thieves will go under the car with a hacksaw and cut off them. And there are hundreds and hundreds being taken in, in the East Metro area every month. And we just let that happen because well, we could change the law on that, but that kind of thing needs to happen. And I was working on a bill on that and it just got buried in the, in the crisis. So try and do everything and more. Well, that's not something we could all do. There's only so much time and effort people can put into things. One little thing, one little thing that went right for Roseville, by the way. Uh, last year, we failed to pass the, the liquor bill. And so the golf course, um, uh, unfortunately, couldn't go through with its business plan that it had hoped to. But we, have, we accomplished that this year. And the, the Roseville golf course was in the bill. And um, so mm. we, we cleared that hurdle. Yeah, I was able, yeah, on the, on the House side, thank you, Alice, we were able to pass it through on the Senate side, too. Uh, Senator Dames apparently likes drinking and golfing, so it worked out okay. <laughs> um, I want to point out one thing, going back to your previous question, uh, you know, one of the things in the suburbs that has been a little challenging for me has been that we don't communicate as much, and we're not as tight of a community as I wish we were, and I only see that in comparison to my friends in the urban and, and, and rural areas where there's a, a little bit more um, togetherness and communication going on and they're hearing from people more. I, one way the city could really help, and I tell all my cities this, is get those businesses together and get their stories together and get that information to us. If they want to serve as a conduit of those local businesses and you bring them to me, I will go down and knock down the door of deed and the governor's office and make sure that we're answering these questions and getting back to them. I know some businesses have said they've had a tough time getting anything back from Deed, and part of it is just because there's only so many people there and there's such a giant need happening right now. But uh, one thing your senator and representatives can do is cut through that red tape. And so I would encourage all the businesses that are, are there that, that they reach out and use the city as a conduit to reach us and get our information. Give me your information and what you're dealing with and we can see, and maybe if there's something we can do to make a difference like we're trying to do for this Pilates place in, 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 in Arden Hills. Uh, that way we can find a way across that finish line and help them navigate that. And more importantly, and perhaps, you know, humanly, they can be heard and feel like they're being interacted with on a, on a larger level. That is not something that I think is happening right now due to the sheer, sheer volume of what's going on. I wanna uh, use that as kind of a segue uh, since we're sort of to the end of our Q&A time and, and wanna make sure we're speaking of time that we're respectful of everybody. Uh, wanted to just uh, note that uh, the two sponsors of this event, the Twin Cities North Chamber and the St. Paul Area Chamber, I think were are excellent uh, voices to uh, represent uh, what we're hearing from businesses as well as the city, as, as was mentioned by Senator Isaacson. But uh, I, I think that uh, that, uh, that communication can, can work both ways too, in terms of uh, the partnership with the chambers and saying, here's the legislation we're working on, here's something that can be of benefit to uh, the businesses that you represent in, in your communities uh, that then you know, can get that, that, uh, that uh, communication back to the legislature uh, in support of those efforts uh, on behalf of the businesses. And so I think that's a good message to, to perhaps end this, uh, this discussion on uh, to allow time for some of the uh, last uh, couple portions of our program this morning. Uh, but that is one of the reasons that uh, the, uh, Roseville and the chambers partnered uh, with this business council on a monthly basis is to get the voices of business and voices of government together uh, and, and be able to, you know, have some of that, facilitate some of that communication. 
Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to, I believe, Shannon and John to, uh, to begin the wrap up portion. Thanks again to the members of the legislature. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, appreciate that. Um, we'd really like to thank all of our panelists for their time, not only for being here this morning, um, but for your commitment and continuous work um, on behalf of this, of this area at the legis legislature. So let's give our panel one last round of applause. Um, you can either do that virtually or there's, a, there's actually a hand clapping icon um, <laughs> at the front of the screen. <laughs> Okay, and then now, uh, before we lose Mayor Rowe here, uh, let's get a quick update on the resolution that your city council uh, uh, passed uh, last night at your uh, council meeting, uh, Mayor. Thanks, yeah, we were able to uh, pretty quickly with our staff and the council get together on a package of relief for our normal regulatory processes for outdoor seating and patios. Uh, and all the approvals associated with that, as well as the outdoor liquor um, endorsement for people with liquor licenses uh, to be to help facilitate under the, the latest uh, order uh, that allows restaurants to serve outside in a limited capacity to make sure that, uh, you know, starting right away, uh, June 1st, uh, when restaurants are able to do that, that we're able to help facilitate that. So yeah, we unanimously passed a resolution uh, yesterday afternoon that uh, that provides a lot of relief in terms of streamlining the process for approvals, allowing staff to take on some of the roles that otherwise would have to come to council meetings for approval uh, to make sure we can keep those things moving forward. Uh, so hopefully that will be helpful and and uh, be well received by our local restaurants and businesses to uh, to be able to uh, you know do the most they can in these times uh, under the uh, restrictions that they have. That was what was impressive about it, it moving so quickly. Um, and I know you, uh, your staff jumped right in, uh, had to scramble a little bit when the, uh, when the governor put out his order. Um, but that's, that's the great thing about city staff. Sometimes they're, they're already ahead. So yeah, we, we they, they were even ahead of the elected officials. <laughs> even better. Um, we also have Ramsey County Commissioner Mary Jo McGuire uh, give us a quick update on the Small Business Relief Fund uh, that was passed uh, through the council yesterday, or the commission yesterday. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, we were so excited to, to pass that. It's part of our CARES Act funding that we received from uh, the federal government and the legislature is helping us defend that so that we can you know, help our small businesses uh, with their different programs and help them stay stay afloat in these really tough times. So I just wanna say thank you so much to our, our legislative delegation for their work in, in helping us uh, you know, protect that, those mon that money so that we can really get it out to our, our people that really need it. So I, can, I, I could go into a lot of detail, but I think we should do a whole session on all the things that we've got going on. We've got Carrie Collins, as you know, from Roseville, who's heading up our economic development and she's been working so hard on making sure that the, the dollars that we have for small businesses is really targeted in the right place. So I appreciate that. And uh, we were excited to be able to do that. Awesome. And I believe the, um, the applications for that are opening today. Hey, yes. Thank you. They're, yeah. They're, they're today. Yeah. It was really fast. It's a really fast turnaround. We had some public hearings on it. We had some good input on that. And yeah, the, the applications for that aid are, are out today. Yeah. She was, yeah. Today. Awesome. Thank okay, you. so that'll be available on Ramsey on our, website. Yeah, web, on our website. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you, Mary Jo, for uh, the uh, update. We appreciate Commissioner's uh, recap. We'd also like to thank our sponsors here, uh, the Roseville Visitor Association, Highway Federal Credit Union, and uh, for supporting this series, all of you. And we appreciate their help. Let's give a round of applause. So join us next month. Um, we're still gonna be meeting virtually, we're pretty sure. Um, uh, Aline Turnhoff uh, from the Federal Reserve is gonna be here uh, speaking about uh, changing priorities at the Fed, which was already a topic um, of conversation pre-COVID, uh, but definitely is, is more relevant now. Um, registration for that is open, so register early. Um, and then take the opportunity to invite someone from your team or your network uh, to join this group as well, because uh, we always like to see new faces um, and have more people involved 
um, at the next meeting. Great, and uh, we'll see all of you uh, virtually on the 24th. And thank you for attending. Everyone have a great uh, day and a wonderful week. Uh, we appreciate you participating in the Roseville Business Council. Awesome.